Good morning. Um, a few words before I start. I, some of you don't know, I'm a retired college professor, and it's hard for me to stand in front of a room of people without saying something. Uh, just a thought at this time of year. Even though Christmas Day is over, I hope we all try to keep the Christmas spirit in our hearts throughout the year. Love, peace, and joy. Um, remember, kindness and compassion go a long way toward making your world and the world of those around you a lot better. This morning's reading is Luke 2, 41 through 52. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. When they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been ser anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was trying to say to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to, him, to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So today's text is unique in the Bible. It is the only glimpse we get of Jesus between the infant narratives, when he was a baby, which we all know about from Christmas, and then when he's like 30 years old. This is the only, he's 12 years old here. This is the only option we get within the canonical gospels. There were some folks who wrote some other things about him when he was a child, like he's out there playing and he gets a clump of clay and he forms it into a bird and then the bird flies away. But that, that's not in the regular kind of scriptures that we all read. It's there and uh, it's kind of a cute story. But this is the only story we have uh, in the gospels about Jesus at this age of 12. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that this story is not about bad parenting. Okay, so if you're feeling guilty, Get rid of it. It's Christmas. This is not the time to feel guilty. This is not about bad parenting, all right? This is also not a story about disobedient children, all right? So let's just get that out of the way right now. This is not about disobedient children. This, the punchline comes to the end. And I think part of the problem we, when we struggle with this, there's lots of different ways we can go. And I was looking at some sermons that actually said, this is a sermon for you, and this is a sermon for that. And I'm like, no, it's a sermon about Jesus Christ. Let's just get kind of get down to it. That's the whole point of this story. They wouldn't have put it in there for any other reason than it's about Jesus. Um, and um, what we have to deal with is we have to get through some of our own expectations as, as 21st century Americans about what you do with children because cultures vary across the world and the way children are treated, good or bad or differently, is the way it is. I remember when we were living in Chicago, this made a news, no, local news story. Uh, there was a lady who was downtown shopping in Chicago, and she had her baby cart with her. You know, one of those expensive things that you need a degree to be able to fold and unfold. I, you know, I, when I was a father, it was really simple. Anyway, and she would be downtown Miracle Mile, and she would be shopping, and she would leave her child in the cart outside the store. And she went to see. 
I, I already got, <gasps> and that's fine. When the police talked to her, she said, what's the problem? This is what we do in my country all the time. She was from somewhere in Europe, and this was just kind of an okay thing to do. She wasn't in Macy's, like on the third floor. It was one of these, you know, shops where you can see out the window, you can see the cart and stuff. So, you know, so this idea of what's right or wrong in parenting, uh, we need to be careful we don't apply it to this story because that's just not the point of it. So Mary and Joseph, are, they, they take Jesus faithfully up to Jerusalem. He's 12 years old. My understanding is 13 is the big age for Jesus, so he's still too young. He's a year young before he becomes a man in this Jewish culture. He's 12 years old, and we're told right off the bat that they have faithfully attended this Passover festival every year. So it says something about the family. The family is uh, faithful. Uh, they walk with the Lord. Uh, they make their annual pilgrimages. There's three that they have to do, or at least three that Joseph has to do. And Mary at least goes to this one with them. The whole family goes up, and not just their immediate family, but we learn when Jesus disappears that there's a bunch of relatives that have made this trip up to Jerusalem. So they, they have been up there, uh, they've, they've done seven days of the festival, and they're on their way home, and obviously Jesus isn't with them. Uh, and they don't really realize that till a couple days into the trip, and then they start looking around uh, for their son, and they can't find him. And that's probably, even though it doesn't say this, that's probably when anxiety kicks in. Uh, these are humans, right? I don't know about, have you ever lost your child? Uh, I remember this, you know, and Rhonda says this is funny, okay? This is my 30-year-old, you know. We were at J.C. Penney with the family one time, and she's like, you know, one of these, she's a sport yet. And we're looking around, and I'm, there she is, and I go this way, and then I turn back, and she's gone. And, you know, my heart just, like, skipped a beat, you know. And then I heard this laughing from the middle of a round clothes rack because she was hiding, and she just thought it was funny. And that's when I started losing my hair. I mean, I... <laughs> she's the reason I'm bald. <laughs> You know, so there's real anxiety around here, and it tells us that they were, fat, they were anxious. So they start retracing their steps. They go back up to Jerusalem. They're looking around for him, and then they finally find him uh, in, in the temple. And they say, child, why have you treated us like this? That's exactly what I said to Rhonda. Why have you treated me like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Again, there's no way of reading this without some sense of them calling Jesus to account. Okay, son, this was out of bounds, all right? But this remark is brushed aside by Jesus. He doesn't even pay any attention to it, really, because he makes a counter-declaration. He says, okay, well, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house, or, another translation, or be about my father's business? At the age of 12, Jesus has a new calling on his life. We don't know when it occurred. We know that there was a calling on his life when he was born. But at the age of 12, he is starting to form his own identity. He knows his own calling. He says he must be in his father's house. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, there's a string of musts. You know, and I'm going to write, read them because I'm a, I, I preach. So that's what we do, right? In chapter 4 we read, But he, Jesus, said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. In chapter 9, the Son of Man, Jesus, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. Chapter 17, But first, Jesus must endure much suffering and be rejected by, his gener by this generation. And then in chapter 22, for I, Jesus, tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. Jesus has a sense of purpose at the age of 12 that he must accomplish in his time on earth something for his father. The idea that I must do this or I must do that reminds us that Jesus' life was not built on chance or folly. 
He wasn't just getting drifted. He wasn't being pushed through life by the whims of history. In this event, he becomes aware of the divine imperative, and he, and he took steps to fulfill what God was calling him to do in this situation. At the age of 12, his, his life isn't driven by fate, a force that, by the way, many folks in that time believed in. You watch those old gladiator movies. They all talk about fates, you know. The fate. What, what's, in fact, the movie Gladiator talks about fate, right? Russell Crowe's character is all about fate. It's not fate that drives Jesus. It's a controlled destiny sent by his father. But, and he's not driven by political coercion in this situation or religious legalism. This is a relationship with Jesus and his father. Now let's just deal with that father bit for a minute. Second, it had been 12 years since that whole hullabaloo around, the, around his birth had happened. And from what we know, since there's silence about this, they were 12 quiet years. And now Jesus reminds them that his father is not Joseph. I don't know how Joseph took this. He refers to the temple as my father's house, and he reveals his real parentage in this moment. And he is aware of his special relationship with the Father. Something has changed in him that was probably brewing over these 12 years. But here's this moment in Luke where these things become crystal clear to Jesus. Perhaps it was at this moment that both parents were reminded of all these angelic visitations that they had back during that first Christmas. Joseph was told, Mary will bear a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay, Joseph, did you believe that? Mary's visit was just as dramatic. The angel comes to her. Jesus will bear, oh, he, your son, will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Okay, Mary, did you believe that? It's hard to maybe, in the moment, we have a child and we're dealing with this and there's no room in the inn and we had to go up for the census and yeah, we had these angelic visitors and I was scared and it was different, but 12 years down the road, I don't remember any of that stuff. Vaguely I remember it. And here's this moment where I must be in my father's house that maybe, maybe, just maybe, uh, brought it back to him. But then they were told that they did not understand what he had to say. So, you know, you ever wonder about this? You know, Lord, sh send me an angel. Just, just direct my path. Just show up and tell me what I have to do. And 12 years later, you won't be doing it because you totally forgot it. Third, we see the patience of Jesus. I, I find this amazing. This is, you know, this is why Jesus, this is why we worship them. It says here that he goes back to Nazareth with them and he was obedient to them. So imagine having this awakening where God, you become aware of the special relationship with God and a special calling. I must be in my Father's house. And then to go back with Mary and Joseph and just become a carpenter's son for the next 18 years. When have you ever felt a calling on your life and you feel like, no, I gotta do it now. I gotta go to college now. I gotta get married now. I gotta do this now. And Jesus, I must be in my father's house. And you know what? I got an 18 year, old, 18 year vacation before this actually occurred. In fact, have you ever considered Jesus' life at all? It's not until he's around the age of 30 that he's baptized and he's got about three, four years of ministry and he dies. We think it ought to be the other way around. You know, you get about three years of life, then you find out what your true calling is and then you spend about 60 years doing it and then you try to stay alive for another 60, right? It's all about the length of time. Jesus had very little time, but he accomplished what God's will was for him. And he was patient about God making it clear to him when that time would come. So 
where's, where does this challenge us? I think one of the things I, I, that I was thinking about, so what's the strongest influence on you and me on our identity formation? You know, wh what defines our identity? You know, uh, for Christmas, I got Penn State pajama box. I got a Pittsburgh Steeler steering wheel cover. Pittsburgh Steeler pads for the seat belts. Steeler socks, gloves. I know. If you want to get rid of me, you know, New Year's coming up. But does that define me? What defines our identity? Is it your family ties? I mean, we always think, you know, look, I'm a bees or I'm, I'm an odd or I'm, whatever your family is. Is that defined? I'm a Dubuquer, right? If you were raised here in Dubuque. And this is defined. This is just what Dubuquers do, right? I, I don't, I'm not dismissing that. I'm not, please don't hear that. Or is it your religious experience? I grew up Catholic. I grew up Protestant. I grew up Mormon. I grew up whatever. I grew up atheist. I don't know. Or is it a sense of your vocation? My wife, God told her she was going to be a teacher, and she used to line her dolls up and teach them when she was a little girl. And lo and behold, she became a teacher. Or is it one's dreams and ideals? What defines our identity today? And I'm not saying anything, any of those things are wrong. But here, what, in this story, Jesus found his identity in affirming his relationship to his father, God. Yeah, he's still a carpenter's son. But he's God's son. He's, he's in relationship with God. But here's the deal. We can say, but, uh, but pastor, that's, that's Jesus you're talking about. That, you're not talking about me. But in John's gospel... That great opening in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You know what it tells us? It tells us that those of us who believe on the light of the world, on Jesus Christ, then have the privilege and right to become the children of God. Is that the lineage that your identity is coming from? Is that where your identity comes from? That I'm a child of God, the maker of the universe, the one who gives life, to everyone. This isn't just a human reality, right? Oh, we're all God's children. Yes, we are. No, we aren't. We're all created by God. He puts a seed in us. We all bear his image. But here's what John's telling us. Until you believe in Christ, you really aren't his child. There's another relationship here, a family identity that we take on. Is that the identity that shapes you every day when you get up in the morning. In that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, is it shaping us more than the other externals and internals that fight for their place in our psyche? The career is important. The career is important. Jesus trumps your career. Education is important. It is important. Jesus trumps your education. It doesn't mean you don't get it. It just means, is he forming your identity or all these other things that, you know what, you're going to find out in life, they're going to be taken away from you. You're going to age. Uh, you might end up in dementia. So that education means nothing anymore. You might not even know who your family heritage is anymore. It's Christ. It's the only thing that stays with you. Didn't mean to get so down there, but I mean, it, it's the true second. Here's the second thing I think this story wrestles with, this, this sense of calling, which I already talked about. He said that he must be in his father's house. There, is there a must factor in your walk with the Lord? Is there a must? I mean, is there one thing? If, I, if, we, had, if we just broke this up into a discussion right now, and I just asked you to talk to your neighbor and define the must in your life when it comes to Jesus Christ. What is the must factor? That if someone came up to you and said, you know what, I have to, well, I guess I can't use half because then it becomes the have factor. I, I must do this for Jesus. I must. Not because it's a legalism. He put it in my heart, and my heart breaks if I don't do it. What is the must factor in your walk with the Lord? 
You know, we live in a time when there are so many things that have become negotiable. Can I just tell you, looking out right now at this church, it is so different from the church I grew up in. That doesn't mean this church is worse or my church I grew up in was better, but I'm just telling you right now, in the church I grew up in, every man would be wearing a dark suit and a white shirt and dress suit. That's the way it went. We have a picture of my sisters and I taken outside our house, and my mom's got a pillbox hat with a veil. Sisters have pillbox hats with veils, dresses, white gloves, pearl. Now we're at a point where you don't, it doesn't matter what you wear, right? And I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying it's bad. It changed. Music, Bach choirs. That's what the Moravian church had, Bach choirs and an organ. We got guitars and different music. Things change. Uh, even attendance at church, I think, has become negotiable. I think we struggle, churches struggle around the country because as Americans, we feel the church is just an appendage. It's like an appendix. Yeah, you got to have it, but I don't know really what it's for. It's about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That trumps everything. And yet we see Jesus here. I must be in my Father's house. And this is the same house that he will critique very heavily. He'll say, you know, the leaders of that house are like whitewashed tombs. What's the must factor in your life? Now, perhaps I'm, and let me just build on that Father's house thing. It was in a temple where he seemed, everything seemed to come together for Jesus. He's talking to the Pharisees and teachers. He's giving them amazing answers. He's asking them amazing questions. And some of these leaders might have been the same crew that voted to have him crucified when he's 30 years old probably didn't remember who he was. He would become a critic of many of the things done in the temple, and yet, you know what? You read, I don't know how many times in the New Testament that he goes to Jerusalem, the holy city, because that's the city that God had put his fingerprints on. And for us as Christians, can I just say, in this community, there are churches all over the place, and these churches have God's fingerprint on them because they're his body. I'm not saying they're good churches. Bad. They are his body. And we've got to deal with it. We've got to live with it. And I, I'm just saying, I think on a Sunday, it's my own personal opinion, we ought to be in the community worshiping our Lord because that's what Jesus did. Right. So that lastly, Jesus gives us a good example of waiting upon the Lord. He lives in his, to his mid-30s, we believe, and he spends all three years attending to the needs of his... He spends all but three years attending to the needs of his parents. Now, we know this is the last story we have about Joseph. He dies somewhere. We believe he dies because we never hear about him anymore. So Jesus ends up taking care of Mary and his Protestants, we believe, his brothers and sisters. Because we believe there is an extended family here that, that happens before Joseph dies. So he's the oldest, and he takes on the responsibility until the Lord calls him, which is a whole other sermon right there. Because we always, I always talk to people about, what, what, what do you do for the Lord? I got too many responsibilities to, to do this religion thing. Well, okay, Jesus was responsible for a household, and he still did what he had to do. But anyway, so he's, you know, he said, We're in this situation where we just can't wait to grow up or we can't wait to get out of school or we can't wait to get going on our career. We just can't wait, period. But faith says this, hold on, hold on, whoa, wait a minute. Let's put the brakes on. Wait upon the Lord. Let's not be rash. Not saying you're not going to finish your education. Not saying you're not going to have a career. Not saying you're not going to get married. No, those are not what's, what's going on, but let's... Are we talking to the Lord about this stuff? Is he part of the conversation? Are we including him on this, or do we just feel, oh, the Lord's told me to do this, boom, let's go? You know, uh, when I read this passage, it, what's clear to me is God has to be given free reign to shape us and direct us. 
And I don't know how often I give God free reign. You know, and it even feels strange to me to say I have to give God free reign. Because he's God. But this is the amazing thing about grace. He's not there twisting my arm to be the kind of person that he would love me to be because he knows if I would be that person, man, life would be so much more fantastic. As he says, abundant, fulfilled. I have my own path that, that keeps interrupting me. You know, my own plans, even as a pastor. Well, this is what you got to do, Tim. And the Lord just kind of stands back and says, tisk, tisk, tisk. You know, Tim, when are you going to wake up? Let me have free reign here. Let me do the things I need to do. Just kind of step out of the way. You know, get into some prayer time. Read the word. Worship. You know, take it easy. Bella came over to our house, and, and we heard her say to Raven, uh, Raven, be cool. I, <laughs> I think God says that to me all the time. Hey, Tim, be cool. Not like cool. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> But cool, cool, cool. You know, there are many components to this life, but I think this is the hardest part of our faith. I think the Lord wants us to take the time, wait, define our identity through him, figure out what the musts are, listen to him, seek him, follow him, and then just get on with life. You don't need to overcomplicate this. Follow him. Pretty much laid out for us in black and white in the Bible. There's some red, red and white in there in some of your Bibles. But it's there. This is what I love about the Lord. You know, when I'm on my own plan, he doesn't say, that's it, Tim. Hit the road, Jack. I'm done with you. Never says steps back and say, okay, because I know you're going to come to me. And when you come, it's full bore, open arms, let's go, buddy. Let's go. That's grace, that's love, that's our Lord. Right? Amen.